Hello and welcome. Uh, so in this lecture, we are going to continue our discussion on OWL. And uh, in the last class, we have started working on certain basic constructs or basic uh, vocabulary items that uh, we have in the OWL language to uh, give some examples of the constructs that we have discussed in the last class. So we have focused on how to create a new class, how to define a new class, how to uh, make one class equivalent uh, with another class and most importantly we have discussed about how to uh, create restriction classes uh, over the properties so these restriction classes they are defined uh, on the properties so the examples of the restriction classes include like all values from some values from and we have seen that how they are uh, related to the universal quantification and the existential quantification uh, the way we have learned in first order logic, right? So, in this particular lecture, we are uh, going to continue on different other vocabulary items that are there in OWL and try to see with certain examples how do we represent a piece of knowledge using the newly learned construct, right? So, uh, there are certain special properties uh, which you can ascribe over the properties you describe right or you uh, define right so for example uh, you can designate one property to be one symmetric property so these are kind of these these are uh, called the these are uh, basically the attributes of the or characteristics of the properties you can think them as different characteristics uh, of uh, the properties right so if you define something some property to be symmetric as you can rightly guess that uh, mm, let us take, take take an example so i'm defining this exchange flag width uh, to be one symmetric property now you have defined this which is your in your knowledge base and what else you have in your knowledge base messy exchange flag with ronaldo right and from this, we can infer that the Ronaldo uh, exchange flag with Messi. So this triple we can infer out of these two pieces of knowledge. So this is this is happening because we have defined exchange flag with as a symmetric property. Right. Now we can define one property to be a transitive property. Right. So what you are saying here? So you are saying that uh, so for example, heavier than is a transitive. So, uh, and along with that, we have uh, got two other pieces of triples that are asserted to be true in your knowledge base. The first one being Jupiter is heavier than Earth and Earth is heavier than Venus. And from these three, from these three, you can infer that uh, Jupiter is heavier than Venus by the uh, logic of transitivity. So, if you define this heavier than property to be a, trans a transitive property then only you can infer this triple out of these two triples right you can define a property uh, mm, to be a kind of unique so uh, what do you mean by that so let's say uh, you have uh, uh, mm, a data birth of a person right now this data birth of a person is a kind of unique thing or the passport number of a person or ISBN number of a book. So these are kind of a very unique values. You cannot have uh, more than two values for this, right? Uh, for this property. So these are these we call as uniqueness of the property, right? So you can think this to be a kind of thing like a property which has got minimum cardinality to be zero and maximum cardinality to be one, right? So we have discussed what we mean by mean cardinality and max cardinality of a property right so max cardinality is basically if you have one element and you have uh, a property say p1 and if you say that p1 is having max cardinality to be say 2 then you cannot have you cannot have another uh, outgoing edge from this or one triple that is having a uh, property p1 to be the predicate for this triple. So this is not uh, following the idea that this particular uh, element is having maximum cardinality to be uh, say 3, uh, uh, sorry 2, right. So uh, now 
if you want this to be unique so this you will you will also not allow right so you will be having only one outgoing edge which is p1 and you have a value here so you have the subject predicate and the object and this subject will belong to this restriction class which is having the max cardinality to be 1 right and in that sense you are, you are basically asserting the fact that p1 the value that a uh, 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 subject can have for that property is unique right so let us uh, take what are the implications, see what are the implications. So I define this has birth date to be a functional property. Now I uh, mentioned something like this, Pim Berners-Lee has birth date to be 1956-08 and Tim Berners-Lee has birth date to be 1955-108. Uh, now you can be having uh, different inferences, right? So either these two, these two values are same, right? These two values are same, but as they are date, they, you see these are not really same, right? So in that case, you have an inconsistency in your ontology, right? Because an individual uh, sh uh, might have only one unique value for has birthday, but T Bernardsley having two outgoing edges with birthday, and these values are kind of different, right? So, uh, you see that uh, the only thing that you can infer that we have an inconsistency in our ontology. But this has got another implication. We will talk about this later. We will we'll continue this discussion later. Uh, now, as this, this particular kind of when we try to assert this uniqueness of a property, we do that with the construct functional property. If we define something to be functional property, that means the value for that uh, property for a given subject is unique, right? Uh, now, the inverse, if you take the inverse of uh, mm, the property and if the inverse of the property is functional, right? So first, what do you do? You take the inverse of the property and if that inverse is functional, then uh, that particular property is called the inverse functional property. So if you uh, if we like to have some example related to this inverse functional property, it goes like this. So if we define this biological mother of is one inverse functional property. Now what we have we have Kunti is a biological mother of Oji and Pritha is a biological mother of Oji. Right. Now this biological mother as we have defined it as one inverse functional property. So the inverse of, so inverse of this bio mother of, uh, you can think this to be say has mother, has bio mother. So if we define this to be one inverse functional property, then this becomes to be one functional property, right? Now if you have something like this. What are the kind of inferences that we can draw? So the first inference we can draw. So the so first thing that we need to uh, understand that this has mother of has biological mother is a functional property, right? So that means one individual uh, may have only one mother, right? Now if that individual is having only one mother. So we are coming to the fact that Arjun has mother to be Kunti and Arjun has mother to be Pritha. So either Kunti and Pritha they are the same individuals. If that is not so, then we have an inconsistency in our ontology. Right. So let us try to visualize visualize this particular concept of inverse uh, the relationship between this inverse functional property and the functional property. Right. So what you have? Uh, Arjun has a uh, uh, biological mother to be Kunti, right? And Kunti uh, is a biological mother of Arjun. Now we define this uh, biological mother of to be inverse functional property. And what is the inverse of this property? Inverse of bio mother is has bio mother, right? And as we have defined bio mother of as inverse functional property, uh, this has by a mother will be inferred as functional property. Now, as this is a functional property, you cannot have two values 
uh, for has by a mother for the same subject. Now here we are exactly having that situation. So we are having Kunti to be uh, the bio biological mother of Arjun and Pitha uh, to be the biological mother of Arjun. So either you have to tell that these are basically same individuals. So this is one case or your ontology is ontology is inconsistent. Ontology is inconsistent. Right. Uh, now, uh, let us move to uh, the other kind of constructs which really helps us to model uh, something like you want to define a class which is basically uh, maybe intersection of multiple classes or union of multiple classes or complement of another class right so these kind of boolean combinations were not uh, there in the rdfs specific so in rdfs you cannot really perform union of uh, or or take one class to be union of multiple classes right so here we want to see that there are certain uh, vocabulary or uh, constructs by which we can do such things right so the first thing we like to discuss is owl union or right so here we are trying to define the fact that people at university consist of staff members uh, and uh, students, right? Uh, so basically, uh, the people at university. Uh, so what? Um, uh, it's so if we if we just try to uh, draw the set theoretic notion. So it is the people of university. Univ, which is basically, uh, if if something is is uh, an element of this people of university, it might be either a staff or a student. Right. So it can be a subset of the set of staff or the the set of union set of uh, students right so actually uh, uh, if you can see that the way we have modeled here we have mentioned that people at university is an equivalent class of union of two classes right so this is the important th thing that we uh, uh, we like to discuss in this slide so we are taking the union of the class of staff members and the student and that union is we are trying to make it equivalent to people at university right but if you think of uh, at the right modeling perspective uh, so there might be faculty members so it's better to use rdfs subclass of rdfs subclass of rather than to use equivalent class so i have deliberately put this equivalent class in this example to show you that depending on the situation, you might need to model the things either in a subclass way or equivalent class way. So this is a classic example of using subclass of a construct rather than to use equivalent class construct, right? So how do we represent this in first order logic form? So let us try to uh, see how do we do that. So basically, uh, uh, we will be using one forward implication because we have one subclass relation. Right. So for all X, for all X, we say people at university X, and this implies that this this particular entity is either a staff staff X or a So this is a corresponding first order logic representation of the structure that we have mentioned here in this RDF XML, right? Similarly, uh, we can define the intersection of, so inter we can define intersection of multiple classes, right? Now, the example that we like to have here is the CS faculty is equal to the intersection of the faculty set and the set of objects from CS department. So what we, what we are trying to model. So this is the set 
this is the set uh, CS faculty, CS faculty set, right? And we want to make this to be equal to the intersection of the faculty set. So, this is your faculty set and another set which is basically having the specification that whatever you have in this uh, thing, they, they belong to CS department, right? So, a table can belong to CS department, a chair can belong to CS department, a book in the CS department library can belong to CS department. But if we take the intersection, then only the elements who are member of faculty as well as uh, the thing that belongs to the CS department will be termed as the CS faculty. So, here this is a case where you will be using the uh, um, equivalent class uh, formalism or um, model. So basically, what what we are what we are trying to do, we are trying to uh, say that the faculty in CS, this is the class which we are defining. This is a equivalent class, so this part is captured by the first two statements, right? Now, what is it is what is it equivalent with? It is equivalent with the intersection intersection of the faculty class, which is basically this, and we are putting a restriction over, so we are creating one restriction class. And again, uh, to uh, remind you, so whenever we define one restriction class, the restriction should always be on a property and it should have a value, right? And what is the uh, restriction or what is the property on which we are putting the restriction? We are using the property belongs to, right? And uh, what would be the value that the range of this property will take? Basically, CS department, right? So, uh, if you have something, say, x belongs to, belongs to y, right? So, this is what we are trying to uh, put the restriction on, right? Now, this should always be an element of CS department, right? So, if this is so, then this x would be an element of this restriction class. So, this will then belong to this restriction, right? And we are taking intersection of this particular set. So, this, this basically represents a set. So, if I number this set to be 2 and number this set to be 1, so this restriction class is basically representing the set 2 and this is representing the set 1 and we are taking intersection and th that intersection gives you the faculty in C. Right. So, now let us try to see uh, how we can model this using first order logic. Right. So, for all the F, the fact CS, fact CS F, this as we are using this equivalent class, there will be both way implicated, right? So, it will be the intersection of faculty. So, faculty, first of all, F should be a faculty and this F should belong to CS, right? Belong to F, CS, right? So, that is how we will be modeling this particular construct using first order logic. Right. Now, in uh, many cases, uh, you need a Boolean enumeration of the thing, right, of uh, um, to define certain class. So, for example, here we are trying to model uh, or define the wine color class, right. So, how we are defining this? We are just saying that wine color is a class consisting of three uh, individuals one is white red and rose right so these we, we are not defining them under any class so that's why they are becoming to be the member of the thing class which is the top class in owl so this owl thing is the top class owl thing is the top class which is basically the super class of every class and it is the uh, set of it is a set representing 
the set of all the individuals that you have in your ontology, right? So here you are trying to define the wine color class, and what is this wine color? Wine color is one of these, either white or red or rose, right? So uh, uh, how do you represent this in first order logic? We say that say uh, wine has got color C, sorry, I need to use a predicate, I forgot the predicate. So, there should be a color predicate, color of wine is C, it implies that either X is white or X is red, or x is rose, right? Now, uh, so we have defined multi different classes using different constants. Now, let us see how do we define the individual, right? So, whenever we define individual, in many, uh, in most of the cases, we want to define uh, uh, the individual and at the same time we want to put them under certain classes right so if you don't put them under any class they will by default belong to the owl thing class now here i am giving example of how to define one individual and then uh, make it an individual of a certain class so for example this particular id 9493.5.2 it is an ID of one say academic staff member. So this particular, uh, so this is one individual. We are describing this individual, and I, we are to, we are to make this individual to be an instance, to be an instance of this particular class, which is academic staff member. So there are three ways to do this. One is you use RDF description tag and you are uh, defining this ID and you're just saying that this is having RDF type to be academic staff member. So this is one way and the shorter version, a shortened version of this particular thing is you just saying that uh, this, uh, this particular entity is belonging to this uh, class, right, in a, in a single line. And also you can use this named individual uh, construct in OWL to uh, make this particular ent entry, entity or individual to be a member of academic staff member. So anyone can uh, serve the purpose. So defining the individual and making that to be an instance of the class. Now, whenever we are defining the individual, so one thing we have to be very careful about and that particular thing is notoriously called in semantic web term open world assumption so uh, in general ai systems uh, basically we use a closed world system, uh, assumption so where whenever you are defining certain facts in your knowledge base they are treated to be true but whatever facts you are not defining in your uh, knowledge base they are treated to be false right but in open world assumption whatever you are defining they are asserted to be true but whatever you are not defining, you cannot claim that they are false, right? They can become true at any point of time, right? So, we don't uh, take them to be false. So, that's why this world is open. So, any fact can become true uh, at any point of time, right? And whenever you are defining this individual, it might be, uh, you may might end up with certain curious uh, or uh, I, I'll say uh, very uh, interesting phenomena. So let us look at some of these interesting phenomena or one interesting phenomena here concerning the individuals. But we'll see there are many other interesting phenomena regarding this open world assumption and individual. So here we are defining is taught by to be a functional problem. So this is taught by is a functional. And if we define this to be a functional property, what does that mean? That means that whenever you have some say course, say C, 
and you are having one East.py relationship. You are having some void, right? You cannot have more than one, right? So you cannot have another East.py. So if we do so, your ontology, your definition, your knowledge base will be inconsistent. Right now, with this definition, let us assert we need uh, courses. Sorry, yes, one one course and uh, the individuals that teach this. Right. So we are defining CIT one 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 one. This is the course we are defining. We are making this to be a uh, member of the class course. Right. And we are asserting the fact this is taught by nine four nine three one eight. And it is also taught by 949352. So if we draw it, how will it look like this particular representation? So you have a CIT, CIT1111. This is a member belonging to a, a class a course. And this is taught by is taught by 949318 right and it also uh, is taught by as per this knowledge base 949352 right so uh, Apparently, we can infer that there is a there, there is an inconsistency in the ontology because we have defined this e dot by to be one functional property, and by that definition, it cannot have more than one value for a given subject. But we are having two values. But we will see that this is not a case of inconsistency. Why? Because you have not explicitly mentioned that this particular uh, that this particular 949318 and 949352 they are different individuals right so this is really following the fact that one individual can have different names so the name of one individual can be multiple and this particular thing is called unique name assumption. So let me write it here. Unique name assumption. And OWL knowledge base does not follow this unique name assumption. The unique name assumption is basically uh, asserting the fact that one individual can have only one name. Right. But uh, OWL does not follow this because of the fact this is the language for describing the thing on the semantic web and you can, uh, de you can define, uh, you can represent one particular individual with many names, right. So that is why uh, we, we do not follow unique name assumption in semantic web domain. So that means if you do not explicitly mention that these two individuals, these two individuals are different then this will be treated to be consistent right so there are two cases one is if you declare them to be individual i'm declaring this 949318 and 949352 to be different from each other if you do so then your ontology will become inconsistent because this is taught by is a functional property and you are having two different values to be the value for is taught by uh, for a given subject right so there you can see one inconsistent but if you declare this thing like uh, 949318 is same as 949352 then your ontology becomes consistent Right. So, this unique name assumption and this open world assumption, uh, these two are basically 
uh, is a combination that uh, is uh, uh, for which we need to be very careful whenever we are trying to infer certain things out of the knowledge base. And we will see that there are many other complicated scenarios where this uh, interplay between this open world assumption and unique name, uh, unique name assumption will come into play. Right. We will discuss that later. Now that brings us to the uh, requirement that if you have say many such individuals, you know in, a, in an university you have got many lectures, right. So it is not really possible to define the distinct uh, differentness of them pairwise. So for that we, if, if we want to declare them together all to be different, we will be using this construct all different, right. So this all different whatever uh, uh, IDs or URLs you will be having inside this, they will be treated as different in it, right. So, these are distinct members. In this collection, what you have seen, what you can see, they are distinct members and they are treated to be different, right. Now, uh, we have really discussed many constructs uh, in OWL. So, those are kind of called OWL elements. So, let us try to summarize what are the kind of things we have discussed. So, we can define one particular class using OWL class uh, um, construct. Uh, OWL thing is the class which is basically the super class of every class. OWL nothing is a class which is basically called the bottom class and uh, it is the top class of every class. So, this is called the top class and this is called the bottom class. With named individual, we can define one individual. Right. So, this is to define one individual. We can make use of RDFS elements in OWL. So, what are the RDFS elements we can use? Subclass of property, subproperty of domain range, all these things we can use. Right. We can use the XML data types uh, that are defined in XML schema definition. We can uh, uh, define the characteristics of the property. So, we can designate one property to be object property and what is an object property? Where you have the URIs at both the ends, right? So, if you have something like S, P and O, this S and O, they are both URIs. So, uh, the, these kind of properties are called object properties and these are also called abstract properties, abstract properties. Right. Now, data type property, they concerns the values. So, whenever this O, uh, in uh, instead of being one URI, it, if it becomes a value, right, then we use data type property. For example, age of a person, height of a person, right. So, these are also called concrete load. Inverse of use is used to uh, mm, define the inverse of a property. You can define a property to be transitive. Uh, symmetric, functional, inverse functional, all these things you can do with basic OWL uh, specification, right. Uh, we can define many uh, restriction over the cardinality, right, cardinality of a relation, right. So, if you say that a particular relation for a given subject, say P, it can take multiple values, right, it can take multiple values. So, we can restrict the number of values it can take and this number of values basically representing uh, the number of outgoing edges from a given subject and having levels to be all the uh, property uh, same to uh, the same property to be the levels of all these things right. So, uh, if you have say three outgoing edges with P, we say uh, for this particular property, for this particular property the cardinality uh, um, of this particular property given this subject is 3, right. Now, you can restrict the cardinality based on uh, defining the mean cardinality or max cardinality or exact cardinality. So, whenever you say cardinality, we mean exact cardinality. So, if we want to say, uh, let us let us try to discuss it a little bit more, O2 and O3, right. Now, I can say this S, this particular S, 
belongs to a class and which is the this class this class is basically the uh, class uh, having t values for property p right so this c can also be the uh, mean cardinality uh, 3 right a class having mean cardinality 3 yes s may al also belong to this but s will not belong to the class of uh, the class having mean cardinality to be uh, say 4 right so s will not belong to the class having mean cardinality to be Uh, now, whenever we are trying to uh, relate the classes with other classes, we can make use of this uh, equivalent class relationship. We can make two classes to be equivalent with each other. We can make two properties to be equivalent to each other. Uh, now, if we want to ask what we mean by the equivalent property, what is the uh, mathematical definition of equivalent property? Now, we are defining property P1 to be equivalent to be property P. What do we mean by that? Now, property P1 can be represented by a set, right? And what is that set? This set is basically the uh, pairs, the pairs that are related via this property P1. And what is this set for P2? The set for P2 is basically also a set of tuples or uh, kind of pairs that are related via P2 relation, right? And when we say that P1 is an equivalent property of P2, then we say SP1, this is a set which is basically equal to SP2. So, these two sets are equal to each other, right? We can define the equality of uh, the individual. So, these are for, uh, classes, equivalence of the classes. This is the equivalence for the properties and this is the equality of the individual, of individual, individual, right? And on the other hand, we can make certain uh, uh, mm, uh, individuals to be different from each other. A pair of pair of individuals to be different from each other. So this is for pair of individual, right? And if we want to say uh, that a set of individuals that are all different, so th we can use all different from the so set of individual. We want to make them all different, and for that we also use this distinct member, right? Uh, we can we can. Uh, Define restrictions over the over the properties and concerning the restrictions. What are the keywords we can use? We can define a restriction class using this owl restriction uh, construct and the restriction is on a property and the, the type of restriction can be all values from or some values from. So these are the types of restriction. Types of restriction. Right. Uh, you can define intersection of different classes, you can define union of different classes, all these things, right. Uh, now, if we talk about, so these are the kind of things that are available in simple, uh, all, all OWL families you can think of. But in OWL DL or OWL full, you have other kind of uh, constant, right. So, for example, one of, so you can, uh, we have, uh, uh, Define this wine uh, color to be one of red, uh, white, and rose, right? So, for that, we use this owl one of. So, this is not available in say owl light, but it is available in owl DL and full. You can also make use of data range. For example, say number of days is uh, between say 0 to 365. So, you can use data range but not in uh, owl light, in owl DL or owl full. 
you can define a uh, disjointness of the classes so you can define two classes to be disjoint with each other but again not in our life right you can make two uh, classes uh, to be equivalent to each other so this is also uh, there in simple owl right you can uh, use owl subclass of right now but there is a certain distinction so this distinction is these equivalence between the classes they are applicable in complex class expressions but this equivalent class relationship which is uh, there in our life this is defined for the primitive classes so if primitive class expression so this c1 and c2 these are some basic classes you can make them to be equivalent but you cannot say that say uh, c1 the intersection c2 is equivalent to say c3 intersection not of c4 so this you cannot do so this you can do with equivalent class in our dl or our full so there is a kind of restriction of usage of this equivalent class in our life with respect to our dl or our full right and you can uh, make use of any kind of boolean combination of the classes you can class expression so uh, it can be simple classes or uh, complex class expression you can take union of complex class expressions you can take complement of complex class expressions and you can take intersection of complex class expressions right and you can define uh, some values of a property to be a particular value and for that you might want to use has value right so we will be using all this thing as we go forward, forward with examples uh, in different scenarios. So we will be having uh, elaborate uh, set of examples that will kind of illustrate all these constructs going forward. Now uh, so whatever you have we have discussed in now they are available in OWL uh, uh, 1 or the simple OWL. But in OWL2, there had been several extensions. So let us see what are the extensions that we have. So the first extension that we have is uh, in OWL1, the class names, the role names, and the individual names, they are kind of distinct. You cannot use one role name to be a class name or vice versa. Yeah, you can see that this is very restrictive. So for example, uh, one database, they can use the word author. So if you take this author to be one class it can be treated as a class in one uh, database but it, it also can be treated as a property in another database right so now if you want to combine these two these two databases together you see there is a clash so you are using the same uh, uh, url or uri to represent or the uh, name to represent the class and the property right so that is not uh, allowed in owl1 but that is also that is allowed in owl2 so a class name can be used as a role name in owl2 right so let us see what are the kind of things we can do so we are defining uh, a class profession right we are defining this professor as a class and we are saying that rudy studer is an element of the class professor so this is an individual from the class professor right we are also defining a class to be institute this is also a class right now we are defining one object property to be professor right so we are defining this professor here so here we define this professor to be a class but here we are defining this professor to be a property the same name we are using as class as well as property right now here this is we are using this property to say that uh, AIFP which is an institute has a professor root student. So if we try to draw it visually so AIFP uh, professor root student. So this is what we are trying to model right now here you can see that this is acting as a property and that is that is completely allowed in owl2 and here we, the, uh, the class and the properties they, they can share the same name right but this is to be remembered this sharing 
is not allowed for concrete. So, you cannot abstract and concrete also. You cannot uh, use the same name to represent both abstract and the concrete role. So, uh, and you know that that is very logical to think, right? So, these, if you, if you take one property to be both abstract and con concrete role, uh, we will be getting confused that uh, the, the value that we have in the object position, whether that would be one URI or a value, right? So, that is why we should avoid using the um, same name to represent one abstract as well as a concrete rule. Now, in OWL2, we can uh, uh, define a number of classes to be disjoint with each other, right? So, we are defining uh, undergraduate student, graduate student and other student to be disjoint with each other together in, in a single statement, right? So, for that we make use of all disjoint classes. Uh, so, there are certain uh, constructs that have been there in OWL2 ext uh, extension rela related to the characteristics of the roles uh, and the properties, right. So, the kind of characteristics of the roles that we have discussed for the simple OWL is basically uh, uh, property can be symmetric, a property can be say functional, a property can be transitive, right. But we want to go beyond that. So, let us see what are the things we can do. We can define a property to be asymmetric. So, as we have defined a property to be symmetric in OWL1, but in OWL2 we can define a property to be asymmetric. So, basically to say that if A is related to B uh, via role, then B is never related to A via the, the the same role, right. So, if we do that, we, we define that particular role to be asymmetric, right. You can define a property to be reflexive. So, where every individual uh, A is related to itself via this role. So, we will be having example for this as well. So, these kind of properties are called reflexive property and the opposite of this reflexive property is basically the irreflexive property. So, no individual is related to itself via uh, such a role, right. So, if we try to give example of this reflexive property and uh, um, say irreflexive property, so we can think of say uh, um, the self, self taught student, right. So, you can have an example of reflexive property to be uh, um, so teaches. So, if we allow so, we have a property teaches. Now, one particular entity can teach itself or himself or herself. Then we say that this teaches relation is reflexive. Right. But uh, say father of x, y. So, one you cannot have a relation like father of x x. So, this is not allowed. So, that is why we say that this father of is an example of irreflexive property, right. Uh, now, as we can define the disjointness of the classes in OWL2, we can also define the disjointness of the properties. And basically, disjointness of the property will also uh, uh, um, following the similar kind of mathematical formalism that if you have two properties say p1 and p2 we can know, we can we can uh, we know that how to represent this p1 and p2 in set theoretic notation so we can derive a set of uh, set representing p this is basically all the pairs that are related via p1 right and S of P2, which is basically the set of all the uh, pairs that are related via P2. If you take intersection of these two sets, if you come up with one empty set, then we say these two properties P1 and P2, they are disjoint. Right. And as we can uh, do pairwise disjoint, we can do disjointness, define disjointness of multiple properties together using all disjoint properties. Uh, we can define some property to be 
to, uh, top object property uh, so this is kind of thing which is already uh, existing if you we will be giving example demonstration of certain tools there we'll see that this top top object property and this bottom object property is there already there in the system so this is a kind of equivalent of say having owl thing owl thing and this is equivalent to owl nothing right so these are relevant to the classes and these two are relevant to the properties right uh, and uh, uh, we can also define our data property to be top object property and bottom top data property and bottom data property and these all relate to so these relate to object properties and these are relevant to data properties right now in owl2 we can define a property inverse of a property and for that we will be using the keyword inverse right now let us try to model this scenario so if exam a has the person B has examiner, right? So, what we have, we have something like this. So, um, we have has examiner A, B. If this is true, then we can infer that participates in B A to be true. So, if A is an examiner as, um, in B or uh, exam, sorry, exam A, so this is the exam. Exam A has B as the examiner then B has participated in A. So, this is what we can infer out of. But what we also can see that not every B who is participating in exam A is also an examiner in A. So, this is also true, right? So, how do we model this kind of thing, right? So, we will be using this uh, inverse of constant. Right. So, we are trying to define this has examiner property. We are defining this has examiner property. What is this? This is basically a sub property, a sub property of an object property, and that object property is an inverse of participated in. Right. So, let us try to visually uh, present this particular idea. So, this is the property that we are trying to define and this is the sub property, this is, this is, this is a sub property of another property and we do not know what is that, right. And this is basically inverse of participation, participated in. Now, uh, intuitively we can see, we can name it to be as participation. So, this has examiner is a sub property of has participation. So, that means whoever is uh, uh, so or, or a exam which is having an, an examiner that exam has got participation of that particular uh, person right. So, that, that is how we can infer right and you are saying that this is an inverse of participated right. So, this is how we are defining has examiner. And with this, we assume that this participated in has already been defined, right? Now, how do we extend this visually? So, this A is the set of exams. So, these are the exams. This, this particular box uh, circle is the set of exams and A is a particular exam. Now, A has got an examiner which is a kind of uh, B. Right, B1. And you can see that 
this set can be mapped to this set P1. So, whoever, so if you have got multiple several exams here, right, and these exams will be having examiners, they are belonging to this say, set B1. So, let us assume that, right. But this, uh, there can be another set which is uh, kind of say B2, and this B2 might not be, might be disjoint with B1. And this might be having elements who have participated in the exams. Right. So, this entire set who has participated in the exam, the entire set who has participated in the exam is a superset of this B1 and B2. So, there is other elements lying outside the set B1 who has participated in A. So that is the exact thing that we are trying to model, right? So basically, uh, what kind of first order logic statements we can make here? So you have has examiner, minor. If you have this, then you can infer you can infer that B has participated in A in A, right? And also, if uh, A has participation B, if A has participation of uh, B, then we can infer that B has participated, sorry, it should be participated in B A, B has participated in A, right. Now, if A, which is the particular exam, A has participation of B and from this what we can infer? We can infer that participated in in B A. So here we are uh, using a mix of sub property of an inverse of, right. Now in many cases, you might want to chain multiple relations together to come up with new relation, right. So here, uh, for example, we are trying to define the has uncle relation, right. So we are saying that x has uncle y, and how do we define that? Now if it will be true if x has parent p and this p has brother y. Then only we can say that x has uncle y. Right? So you can see that this is kind of creating a chain. Right? So what kind of chain that we are talking about? So x has parent p. And this P has brother Y. And from this we can infer that X has uncle Y. So you can see we are we are uh, representing this to be more or less equivalent to this particular chain. And we are defining this, this has uncle to be sub property of this property chain. We are defining this has uncle property to be the sub property of this particular property chain, right? And that we can do with using this owl property in axiom, right? So we are asserting some axiom related to this property chain. So this is a kind of axiom that we are inserting to the system, right? So how do we represent this in owl uh, uh, RDF XML? 
So we are defining has uncle. And this property chain exam is basically uh, a chain of multiple properties. So that's why you are using the collection construct, right? And it is consisting of has parent and has brother in the chain. And this sequence should be, this is not a kind of unordered list. So this is one ordered list. Ordered list, right? And there is one restriction. Whenever you are doing this, whenever you are creating a property chain, you cannot use the concrete rule. Cannot use the concrete rule. So why is that? Because you know, let's say uh, we, we use a concrete rule. So let's say P E is a subset, sub property of say P1 10 P2, right? Now let us assume that P1 is a concrete rule, right? And what is what do we mean by concrete rule? Where the object is having a value, right? So we start with S, then we go to something, and we know this is a literal. If P1 is a concrete rule, rule, or it is also a data type property. In that case, this is a literal, right? And as this is a literal, we know that we cannot have any outgoing edge from a literal node, right? So that's why, as we do not have we cannot have any outgoing edge out of this node. The chain is broken here. You cannot have, you cannot proceed further. You have this chain broken here. So that's why this concrete rules cannot be used in defining this uh, chain of the properties or in, in other sense in the property chain exit, right. So uh, in simple OWL or in OWL 1, we have we could define the simple cardinalities right like say max cardinality or mean cardinality right now there we were not really bothered about what would be the mm, classes the object nodes will be belonging to so for example i could define say x uh, say p1 say b1 s P2, V2, and uh, sorry, P1, V1, P1, V3. Right? Now, if I say that whether X belongs to uh, say uh, mean cardinality 3, right? It will be true, right? Whether it is uh, uh, mm, satisfying, X belongs to the class mean cardinality four it will not be the mm, individual belonging to the particular class mean cardinality four right so but there we were not really bothered about what are the types of this so we are not really bothered about what are the types so the type means it should be a class right what are the types right and in many cases we need this that kind of thing so what are the kind of examples you can think of? So if we, let us try to define this exam uh, class in a different way, right? Now we say that the exam class is a subclass, is a subclass of something that has got at least, uh, so at, mo at most, two examiner as professor, right? So we are defining the examiner class. We are defining the examiner class to be something which is a subclass of. So let me draw it. So this exam class. So this is your exam class. And this should be a subclass of something. And what is that? That class is one anonymous class. We are not defining that with a name, but that has got this property that it has got the examiner 
so this has the examiner has as examiner as examiner examiner maximum two professor right now if you just remove this part two professor it has got a maximum a two ex two examiner so this was the specification that we have already worked out it has got maximum two examiners right but here we are imposing other restriction which is it should have at maximum two professor as exam so what we are revising here so we are revising it by saying that this v1 should be a professor in that case x would belong to this set right now if we also say that v2 is a type of professor then x would also belong to this uh, particular set and if we say that v3 is a type of professor then this particular x will not belong to this right now let us uh, uh, re rewrite this as respecify this as exam is a particular uh, class which is a subclass of something that has got uh, mm, two ex minimum two professor as examiner so we are revising this so we are taking the example of mean cardinal So we are defining exam exam uh, to be a subclass of something that has maximum that has minimum minimum uh, two professors as examiner right now let, let us try to redraw the graph you can see here so this p1 means has examiner now v1 belongs to professor as we have done earlier right now v2 is a type of student and v3 is also type of student now here you can see that though the cardinality of the relation in this for this particular x is 3 the cardinality is 3 but when we put this qualification that this objects that you can see they should belong to a particular class which is in this case professor so here you can see that this particular subject it, it is having this particular exam so this, this is a kind of exam exam is having p examiners but one out of them only one out of them is a professor others they are of type student so this then will not belong to this particular set right so x will not belong to this particular set because we have got only one professor who is the examiner who is an examiner of this exam though it has got three examiners the other two examiners they belong to the student uh, class so in that case this particular exam x will not belong to this set right so we are taking care of the mean or the max cardinality mean or max cardinality but along with that we are qualifying this we are qualifying the cardinality qualifying by 
the class uh, to which the property values should belong to. Right? So we can do that for me or max. Right. So now let us see how do we represent this using a uh, first order logic. Let me uh, open another screen. Well, so we are trying to model uh, the fact that uh, examiner is a subclass. Examiner is, is a subclass of something that has got maximum two professor as exam, right? So that is what we are trying to model. So uh, we know that how to model subclass in first order logic. Basically, we will be using single forward way of implementation, right? So for all e exam e. The exam, uh, this would be a subset of something. And what is that? The class, the anonymous class, which has got a maximum two professors has as exam. Right? Now, uh, let us assume that uh, this particular E has got at least three exam. And if we assert that and we just try to negate that, then we will get the class that we are trying to get, right. So if we want to model the fact a particular exam has got three examiners, right, at least three examiners, three examiners, x, y, z, right, and of course, you don't want these to be equal to each other. If you do so, then it will become to be two, two right? They will, they will uh, coalesce with each other, right? So you say x not equal to y and y not equal to z and x not equal to z, right? And along with that, you want uh, this x to be the examiner of e, the uh, e has e has examiner x. Also, you want this x to be a professor, right? And you need to do this for the others, right? As examiner E Y and Professor Y and as examiner E Z Professor Z. Right? So th this means that this E has got at least uh, three examiners who are professors. Right? You just negate this. If you do this, you are just saying that E has at most two examiners. Right? E has got maximum two examiners. So here we are uh, saying that. Uh, exam is something that has at most two examiners as professors. Right. Now, uh, in OWL2, we can define a property to be reflexive. So, here we are trying to see the case of defining a property to be reflexive. And that we do with 
this hash shelf uh, um, construct right so if you define for a particular property this hash shelf value to be true then that property is a kind of reflexive property right so we are defining the class of self dot student right and which is basically equivalent to one anonymous class and this anonymous class is a restriction over the property teaches and we are putting the restriction to be that this property has got the hash shell value to be true right so we are making this hash shell value to be true and that will convert this property to be reflexive right and whichever uh, uh, mm, so basically what we are having we are having the particular x so let me draw the uh, corresponding first order logic representation that we clarify the thing so you are having x to be a member of self dot student self dot student x and we are representing this with uh, equivalent so we'll be using this both way implication so teaches x x so in this in that case x would be the member of the self dot student class right so this basically uh, this set of x's which are appearing in uh, this teaches xx kind of structure they will uh, constitute the class of self dot right so that's how we are defining this class so in owl2 uh, we can also assert some negated uh, relation right and that is done through negated property assertion right so here we say that uh, two entities they are not related via a relation or property so for example i can insert or assert the fact that john nash and alan turing they are not colleagues right and that we do with uh, negated pro property assertion and this negated property assertion it is something like you are making a statement to be false and we as we are talking about statement we should have one subject we should have one predicate and one object right so this subject is represented using owl source individual and p is the assertion property basically the property on which we are putting this negated assertion and the target individual so this target in individual is uh, corresponding to the object part of the triple and you are asserting this triple to be false right in your current knowledge base so uh, with this, uh, 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 let me stop here. Uh, mm, so more or less, we have covered uh, the basic structure or the vocabulary items that we can see in OWL, both in OWL 1 and OWL 2. And in the next lecture, what we will be trying to do will be taking some examples and trying to see how we can make use of these particular constructs to represent knowledge in OWL and there we will see that there can be different modeling errors which we will uh, need to be very uh, careful about. Thank you very much.